conversation about the digestive tract, we were getting ready to talk about the accessory organs and then end up with the grand finale of the intestines and the anus. As the chyme, which is the acidified food that's full of hydrochloric acid coming from the stomach, as it exits the stomach and enters the small intestines, you have secretions from the liver and from the pancreas. So the liver is going to make bile, send it to the gallbladder where it's stored, and then it's going to spray over the food. The pancreas is going to spray a, an antacid, something to neutralize the hydrochloric acid so it doesn't actually eat a hole in your intestines. And it's also going to secrete a whole bunch of different kinds of enzymes that are going to digest your food. So these secretions enter right where the stomach and the small intestine join. Depending on which anatomist you talk to, they're either going to tell you that the liver is the largest uh, organ in the body, or they're going to say, no, no, the skin itself is the largest organ of the body. So if you want a formed organ or gland, then it's going to be your liver is the largest. The liver has four lobes, and the, it, the whole liver itself is suspended by a sheet of mesentery. So there's that mesentery again, holding your organs together. And it suspends the liver from the diaphragm. One of the interesting things uh, that one of the ligaments that's helping to hold the liver together is the um, ligamentum teres, which carries blood from the umbilical cord to the liver of the fetus. So you always see the umbilical cord attached to the baby, but nobody actually asks, hey, where did the umbilical cord go? We know on the outside it attaches to the placenta, but on the inside it goes on in to the fetus's liver. So the blood coming, the nourishment coming from mom can be uh, processed. There's an opening called a hilum that allows the hepatic portal vein and the hepatic artery to enter. Now remember, you have the hepatic portal system where you're going to send blood from the stomach and the intestines over to the liver to be detoxified. And so that's going to be a portal system. And then you have the hepatic artery. You're going to find that the vein and the artery are in the lesser omentum. The gallbladder is actually underneath the liver. So if you were to take a hold of the liver and pull it up like you would pull up your uh, shirt, then underneath is the gallbladder. As the bile enters the gallbladder, it's concentrated and concentrated and becomes extremely green. So if you've ever looked at a gallbladder, uh, it, is, it appears to be the most astounding green color. Here's a nice picture that kind of puts together what we're talking about. So here are the liver, and there's some of its lobes. And there's the hilum, the opening that allows the blood vessels and also for the bile to come out. Here it is going in, and it just fits underneath the liver. So they've kind of lifted the liver up so that you can see under it, and you can see here's the stomach over here to the left, and then they've kind of ghosted out the stomach so that you can see at the intersection of the stomach and the intestines is where the pancreas is, right there. And the very first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum or duodenum, depending on who you are and how you pronounce it. Here's the round ligament. They used to be part of the umbilical vein, right there. And peeping out, you can see a little bit of the gallbladder back behind. Now they've flipped it over so you can see it. 
and they always draw a very, very virulent green. So remember that the hepatic system, the portal system, is going to be capillaries which come together with more capillaries. And here we see inside the liver, we have part of the hepatic veins where the capillaries come together and make veins. You can just see that it's going to be a filtration unit. You're going to have things flowing through here. If you look over here, another filtration unit. And you have sets of three. They call it the hepatic triad of the bile duct, the hepatic artery, and the hepatic portal vein. There you have. So they call those lobules. Uh, this means diminutive or smaller. So you have four lobes of the, of the liver, but then you have lobules, which are little bitty segments, like we were looking at in this picture right here. So there's a lobule, and there's one over there. Of course, that picture is very much magnified. So the lobules are only about two millimeters long, one millimeter in diameter, so they're not very big. And down through the middle, you're going to have the central vein. So it's kind of like a, a collecting area. And then we call the cells that are in the liver hepatocytes. So hepato means in the liver and site means cells. They're cuboidal cells and they're surrounding the central vein in, re in radiating uh, sheets or plates, whichever you like to call it. So here's a picture under the microscope showing you the central vein and those radiating sheets or plates that they were talking about. Remember when you see the word cuboidal cells or square cells, you know that something is being secreted or absorbed. Blood goes in between those plates and it can go through fenestrations. Remember fenestration is like a window. So you can go through the endothelium and uh, it separates the hepatocytes from the blood cells. You're getting the plasma. It seems almost like it's doing something like the kidneys do in the filtration. But it allows the plasma into that space and you have microvilli that can uh, increase the surface area. So you, you touch more of the blood that's being filtered and you can absorb things. You have macrophages that can eat things that shouldn't be there. Now remember, the blood is coming from the stomach and the intestines. So it's coming down and a sinusoid means a small sinus. So you have large sinuses like in your head where you get sinus infections, but these are little small uh, collecting areas. And doesn't this sound a lot like the kidneys? After you eat, the hepatocytes absorb out of the blood glucose, amino acids, iron, vitamins, and other nutrients to break it down further or store it. In between meals, when you're running out of glucose, the signal goes to the liver to break down glycogen. Now remember, if you're putting glucose together in a plant, we call it starch. But if you put the glucose together in a human, we call it glycogen. So it's just like a string of beads and you can pop the glucose off and use it. So it puts the glucose back in the blood so that you don't have to continually eat to continually put glucose in your bloodstream. But here's one of the uh, most important functions of the liver. It will take hormones and break them down so it stops their action. Toxic substances that you eat, or in the case of alcohol, 
uh, most people think, well, alcohol is not toxic, but it is. So luckily your liver can break it down so that it doesn't damage you, but but it is, it is uh, toxic. And if you drink too much, of course, your liver slowly turns to scar tissue. We call that cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, you're also going to take some of the bile pigments out, um, any drugs that you've taken, whether they're recreational drugs or drugs that your doctor has prescribed for you. And then they're going to secrete into the blood albumin, lipoproteins, which is a protein with a fat attached to it, clotting factors, so this is really important because you need clotting factors in case you hurt yourself, angiotensinogen, so whenever you see the, the ogen on the end of it, it is an inactive form. So we're going to have to cut off some of the amino acids and make angiotensin and other things. So on the other slide, when we were looking at the cross section of a, a lobule in the, in the liver, the hepatic lobule, we saw the triad that had the portal vein the artery, and the bile ductal. So these three things are working together. You're getting blood into the sinusoid so that you can filter it, uh, but you're also getting blood from the intestines that may or may not have um, toxins in it, but definitely has nutrients in it. And then you're also getting oxygenated arterial blood. So you need this artery to bring in oxygen to keep the liver functioning. So you bringing in blood from the liver, excuse me, from the um, stomach and the intestines through the portal system, but you need to get oxygen in there also. So these three work together. So after the plasma has filtered through the sinusoids, then the blood is collected into the central vein and, and it goes back and into circulation. So again, this is kind of like when we were studying the uh, kidneys and we talked about how the plasma goes through the glomerulus and it's processed through the proximal uh, convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule. And then it in, goes into the collecting duct well, in the liver, it goes into a central vein, which is a collecting area. And then blood goes directly, after it's been cleaned, into the inferior vena cava, which goes into the right side of the heart. And then it's sent over to the lungs to be oxygenated. So here are all your systems fitting together. So here's the artist's representation of what we're talking about. So here's the blood coming in through here. And you see the fenestrations. You see the openings. So they're big enough for the plasma to leak through, but they're not big enough for the red blood cells and the white blood cells to leak through. So the, the blood cells, the formed elements, remain trapped in there. And then you see the microvilli, and here is your cuboidals. So they can absorb or they can secrete. And so we, we saw some of the stuff they're absorbing and secreting. So these are your hepatocytes right here. And there's your fenestrated layer right there, allowing the plasma in. And this whole area is called the sinusoid. And I forgot to point out the macrophage. So stellate is star-shaped, so it's got projections coming out. And if there's something in the blood that shouldn't be there, then it gets um, ingested by the macrophage. It gets uh, phagocytized or eaten. So bile leaves the gallbladder, and it comes down the bile duct, where it meets up with the pancreas. And you have like a holding chamber where you've got the uh, enzymes from the pancreas and you've got the bile that's coming. You have a sphincter. How about this name? 
the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So the name says everything. This a sphincter, you know, is a circular muscle that shuts things off or opens up to release things. And hepatopancreatic tells you that it's both from the liver and the pancreas. So you're going to get both the uh, enzymes and the bile. So this sphincter will open up and let the bile and the pancreatic juice into the duodenum. And once all the food is emptied out of the stomach, remember it comes out in about three mils at a time, which is just a little more than half a teaspoon because you've got to neutralize it and you've got to digest it. So it takes a while for the stomach to empty. But you're going to be spraying the food as it leaves the stomach with bile and pancreatic juice. And the bile emulsifies the fat so that you can break it down into smaller pieces and hopefully absorb it into your body. And then, of course, the pancreatic juices have a lot of things. It has to neutralize the acid, but it also has to have enzymes to finish breaking down so that the intestines can absorb. Most of you guys are too young to remember Paisley print. But that was all the rage. And every time I see the pancreas, I'm thinking of the paisley shape. Here is the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So you can see here comes the bile from the gallbladder because it comes out of the, the liver. It's stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. And then it's re-released out and it joins up with the pancreatic duct right there and there's like the holding chamber or the mixing chamber and then there's the sphincter and when it opens up it's just going to release and spray the food right there so they're not showing you where the stomach is because they've taken that away but in your mind you have to put the stomach back I remember as a child asking where the red pigment from watermelon went. So when you ate watermelon, which is bright red, where does it go in the body? Well, now you're going to find out. So bile is has minerals in it, has cholesterol, fats, phospholipids, bile pigments, bile acids. One of the things that you get when you break down hemoglobin is bilirubin. So this is one of the pigments, the colored pigments that you get from hemoglobin. Once you get broken down bits of hemoglobin into the large intestines, you have bacteria in there who are helping us out and they will break down the bilirubin into urobilogen and these are further broken down into colored pigments. One of them, which gives poop or feces, it's brown colored. So there's where the red went. It mixes in with the breakdown of the hemoglobin and uneaten food, undigested food, and all the bacteria that are in the feces. And then you notice that your urine is usually straw colored or yellow colored. And again, that's another breakdown of the bilirubin, which is a breakdown of the hemoglobin. Now, one of the things that, uh, for some reason, people will have the cholesterol crystallize out in their gallbladder. And when this happens, then you have gallstones. And this is not a good thing to have because they can be rough, irregular shaped, and they can rub and cause an inflammation of the gallbladder. And if this happens, you're going to have to have your gallbladder removed because if it ruptures, it can cause, um, it can actually be fatal. So uh, usually you know if you have gallstones, because the pain is unbelievable, kind of like having kidney stones. So gallstones form if bile becomes excessively concentrated with waste. 
Lethison. If you've ever bought a chocolate candy bar and you've left it out in the car when the windows are rolled up and it gets really hot and then you open up the candy bar, it's the chocolate bar, and the, the chocolate has like white stuff on it. And you think, ew, it's like molded or something. Well, no, when you make chocolate, you have to put lecithin in it and it will emulsify the fats that are in the chocolate. And if the chocolate melts and then it rehardens, it doesn't always go back together correctly. And so you have the fats that float to the top and the chocolate stays on the bottom. So there's nothing wrong with it and that's not mold. What you're looking at is just fats that have escaped the lecithin. Try saying lecithin a few times. That's a very hard word to say. So an example I can think of is like when you have peanut butter and you leave it sitting for a while, then the oil floats to the top of the peanut butter and you have to stir the peanut butter to put the oil back in. Only you can't stir a chocolate bar to put the oil back in. But if you look on any chocolate, you're going to see lecithin somewhere as one of the ingredients so that you can get the fat to disperse throughout the chocolate instead of being in big white uh, streaks across the surface of the chocolate. The bile acids, phospholipids, they, they help you with the fat digestion. And again, if you have the fat too large, then you can't absorb it. So I have to go off on one of my tangents because I think it's funny. And um, Lay's is one of the companies that comes to mind. I think there were some others. They realize that if you eat fat that is so large and your body can't break it down, it can't emulsify it with lecithin, then it's going to pass out with your fecal material. And so you're getting all of the wonderful taste of fat. So think of the French fries and how delicious they are, and potato chips, all those greasy things that you love to eat, fried chicken, and how nummy it tastes. So we love the taste of fat on our tongue. But unfortunately, then we, if we eat too much, we'll absorb it into our body. So they came up with something called Olean, which was such a large fat molecule that you got the taste. So they, they made Doritos and, and ruffled potato chips. They had all kinds of things. And on the package, they called them WOW, W-O-W, -W, WOW. So you knew that they had the Olean in them. And they were considered fat-free, even though you could see the potato chips were greasy like they always are. But because it was a fat that you couldn't absorb in your body, they were able to say it was fat-free. And it sounded too good to be true. So what happened was it worked like it was supposed to. You couldn't digest it. You couldn't absorb it. But if you eat grease and you don't absorb it, it's going to line your intestines. So people were having very rapid bowel movements, like a greased pig sliding on through because of all the fat. And if it wasn't time for you to have a bowel movement, you still had that fat lining your intestines, and so it would leak out of your anus. So on the bag it said, may cause leaky anal discharge, greasy leaky anal discharge. So they took it off the market, which was too bad because some people didn't have the diarrhea that it caused and some people didn't have anal leakage. So they really enjoyed being able to eat Doritos without worrying about all the fat that they were getting. So there's one of my uh, side stories. Just in case you think I'm kidding, here is the anal leakage, and the FDA made them put on the package that can cause abdominal cramping and loose stools. So it was called Olean or Olestra was the other name. 
A few more interesting facts about bile. You make it in your uh, liver, and it gets to the gallbladder by filling up the bile duct, and then it comes over into the gallbladder where it is concentrated. So the liver makes anywhere from a half a liter to a liter of bile every day. And remember the bile is made up of bile acids and lecithin and other things. And about the majority of the bile acids are reabsorbed. So we haven't learned the parts of the uh, small intestine yet, but we're going to learn about the jejunum and the ileum. And once the bile acids are used to break down the food, and then you're starting to absorb the food out of the small intestines, you're then going to reabsorb the bile acids so that you can use them again. So you recycle your bile acids, and only a little bit of the bile acid comes out with the fecal material. But this is how you can get rid of excess cholesterol. If you eat too much cholesterol, this is one of the ways that you can do that. Now, remember, cholesterol is not a bad guy. It has gotten a really bad rap, but people who eat way too much cholesterol or people who have a genetic uh, inability to use cholesterol are going to have problems. But you use cholesterol to make all of your steroid hormones. So without cholesterol, you won't have estrogen or testosterone, prostaglandins, or not prostaglandins, progesterone. All of those are forms of cholesterol. So you need them. Cortisol, you need it. You got to have it. But again, too much of anything. So they think that if you eat too much cholesterol, it will actually build up on the walls of your blood vessels and cause plaques and hardening of the arteries and limit the amount of blood that can flow through. So here are some fun words to know. Uh, the proper name for gallstone is biliary calculi. So anytime you see the word calculi or calculus, you know that you have some hard mass of some sort. These, these gallstones can get stuck in the gallbladder or they can get stuck in the bile ducts. They are made mostly of cholesterol, but you also have some calcium in there to, to make it harder. And then some of the bilirubin that doesn't get to be broken down because it's trapped in the stone itself. Inflammation of the gallbladder is called cholecystitis. And if you have the condition where you have gallstones, but you don't have the inflammation, are you ready for this? Cholelithiasis. <laughs> Cholelithiasis. So the word lith means rock. And anytime you see this word right here, you're talking about the cholesterol. And uh, itis means inflammation. So this is the presence of cholesterol rocks or cholesterol stones. But this is where the gallstones, the biliary calculi, have actually caused an inflammation of the gallbladder. And this is where the person has the horrible abdominal pain, the vomiting, and, and uh, a lot of times you're on a fever and they have to go in and remove your gallbladder. It is most common in fat, obese means fat, women over the age of 40. And it uh, your book says that most women over the age of 60 have gallstones. So it's just one of the things that we do as we get older. But unless they irritate or get so large that they actually block the exit of the bile, then they don't really bother you. If you do block the ducts and you can't uh, get bile down, remember it has to go down, mix with the juices with the uh, pancreas, you can get jaundice, so that 
uh, breakdown of the bilirubin that you normally would pee out as yellow or poop out as brown will actually build up under your skin. So you have jaundice and you're unable to digest your fat and fat soluble vitamins. That's one of the giveaways that you have a problem with gallstones is you stop being able to absorb those fat soluble vitamins. And I've mentioned it in another uh, one of the lectures, but I want to go ahead and tell you again what the fat soluble vitamins are because there are four of them that you need to know about. And if you can remember my name is Drake, then you know the four fat soluble vitamins. The D is one of them. There is no vitamin R. There is a vitamin A, K, and E. So you can remember the four fat-soluble vitamins. Now, if you don't have any problems with gallstones, your your everything is working well with your bile, then just the foods that you eat, maybe taking a multivitamin, and you're fine. You have to be careful not to take too much of the fat-soluble vitamins because you'll actually build it up in your fat. And you can actually get toxic levels of D, A, K, and E. And each one of those excesses have their own symptoms, so you don't have too much. But now someone with, with gallstones, they're not going to be able to absorb them. So even though they're eating them, they're going to have trouble getting them into the small intestines and into the body. So a lot of times, the one of the first things you see before you get an inflammation is you find that you're deficient in vitamins, in the fat-soluble vitamins, even though you're eating well you're eat, and you're taking uh, multivitamins and supplements. Now, just like they do with the kidney stones, instead of going in and doing surgery, sometimes if they're small enough, you can hit the stones with ultrasonic vibration. So you can use sound waves and it will cause these rocks, the, remember litho means rocks or stones, it will actually break them up into small enough pieces that they can pass out of your duct. Now if they're too large, you're going to have to do surgery. And a lot of times you just go ahead and take the gallbladder out along with the stones. So here's a picture of some gallstones that they've taken out of people, so you can kind of see the size of them. I think it's interesting as we're going through here and they're talking about how much hydrochloric acid you secrete in the stomach, how much bile you secrete, how much of the um, juices that the pancreas secretes. It's always anywhere from, it's around a, a liter. So in the case of the pancreas, it's going to be about, um, well, if you do it in milliliters, it's 1,200, but this would be like one and a fifth liter to one and a half liters of pancreatic juice every day. You also make over a liter of spit every day or saliva every day. So it seems like the digestive system likes to do things by the liter. Now, one of the things that's just a little interesting thing is you do have an accessory pancreatic duct. So if you don't go through the, the um, sphincter that allows the bile and the pancreatic juice to enter the duodenum or duodenum, then you can just uh, independently go into the duodenum yourself and bypass that sphincter. So you can put pancreatic juice into the small intestines without having bile accompanying. So you do have it like a back door, which is a smaller duct. And, uh, but usually it goes through the hep hepatopancreatic sphincter, where the bile and the pancreatic juice are both released at the same time. So your pancreatic juice is going to be alkaline. You're going to have some bicarbonate in there, which is going to neutralize the acid. You have some active enzymes, and you have some inactive enzymes. The zymogens are inactive enzymes. 
and you have electrolytes. I'm not going to test you over the uh, different zymogens, but here's three of them that they tell you. The, so trypsinogen is cleaved to make trypsin, and chymotrypsinogen is converted. Procarboxypeptidase, how's that? Pro is a precursor form. Back when we were doing chemistry, we learned that there are four groups of macromolecules. And if you forget what they are, just pick up any candy bar or a can of soup. And listed on it, you have to tell fats, carbohydrates, proteins. You don't have to do nucleic acids because pretty much everything we eat has nucleic acids in it. If it's plant, like vegetable stuff, or grains, or animal products, like a hamburger, all of it's going to have DNA or RNA. So you don't have to worry about getting DNA and RNA in your diet. As long as you're eating something, it probably has that. But they have to, by law, tell you what percent of the food that you're eating is fat, what percent is protein, and what percent is carbohydrates. So once you eat those macromolecules and you get them into your small intestines, the pancreatic enzymes, there's amylase to break down the sugars. Starch will be broken down. Lipase is going to break down your fats. And then you have uh, ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease, which will digest RNA and DNA. So all of your major groups are going to be digested. You have the enzymes in your um, pancreatic juices that will digest everything. Now, you do have amylase in your mouth. So some of the starch, some of the uh, glucose breakdown started in your mouth. But then once you get to the pancreatic um, juices, it will take care of any that wasn't broken down uh, before, so you can absorb the sugars through your intestines. Here's a slide through the uh, pancreas so that you can see what it looks like under the microscope. And then here's the artist's representation of what you're actually seeing here. And you have these cells that have the zymogens that are stored in there so you can activate them and then you can release through this duct right there. Now one of the sad things about the pancreas is if you look where it is in your abdomen, first of all, it doesn't have a thick, um, tough outer covering like the heart does. You don't have a pleural sac like you have around the lungs. So if you get cancer of the pancreas, if you get pancreatic cancer, it is very easy to metastasize throughout the body. So usually by the time you realize that you have pancreatic cancer, it's already spread, and you usually only have a few months left to live. So we've seen an amazing number of celebrities who have died of pancreatic cancer recently. Um, Alex Trebek is one of the ones. Um, you have a few of the slides telling you about the different um, hormones, enzymes, things like that, that are working to help you digest. So if you eat fats and they hit the small intestine, that's a signal for cholecystokinin to be released and you're going to stimulate the gallbladder because you need the bile to emulsify the fats and you need a signal to go out to open the hepatopancreatic sphincter to allow the bile to drop down into the duodenum. Then you have secretin and this is secreted in response to acid. 
So you had that food and you mixed it with hydrochloric acid and that drops down into the du duodenum and you're going to need to neutralize that quickly. So secretin does that. It says liver, we need some more bicarbonate. Pancreas, we need some more bicarbonate. So it's going to uh, raise the pH from acid. Remember, acid is anything from um, 0 to 7. So hydrochloric acid is around 2, and we need to get that m much less acidic. We need to get it closer to neutral, closer to 7. So we're going to do that with bicarbonate mostly. This slide points out that the reason the small intestine is called small is because of the diameter, not by the length. The, it is the longest part of the digestive tract. It's about five meters long. So a meter is about three yards. So that would be about 15 yards long. When you're dead and you don't have any muscle tone, then it's quite a bit longer. In this picture, they have color-coded your intestines so that you can kind of tell which is which. So here's your stomach over here on the left side, and you have the duodenum, or duodenum, and it comes down, and there's the jejunum, this part of the jejunum. So they made it kind of a purple color right there, and then the final part is the ileum right here. And you're going to join up with the large intestines over here on the right side. And the giveaway is this little thumb-like projection right here coming off of the large intestine, and that is your appendix. So the small intestines and the large intestines join near the uh, appendix. Now, as foods and things are passing through, some of it gets stuck in the appendix. And if it happens to be something that is prickly or can poke a hole or irritate the lining of the appendix, then you end up getting appendicitis. Remember, itis means inflammation. And uh, you have to go and have your appendix removed because look what would happen if this swelled up and exploded. All of this food, all of these bacteria that you have in here, and of course your large intestine is also full of bacteria, all of that will leak out into the uh, abdominal area, and you'll get peritonitis. And it's very hard. How do you clean up and how do you kill all those bacteria that are, have filled up your abdominal cavity? So you, your GI tract is a tube within a tube. You start with your mouth, you come on down, and you end up with your anus. And nothing should escape except for dissolved nutrients, dissolved medicines, things that you can absorb out of the small intestines. So it can be fatal if you don't treat appendicitis. So if you have a sharp pain, in your lower right side, then you need to see a doctor, especially if you have a fever. But they can tell because they'll just reach down. They know where the appendix is, and they'll just touch you, and you scream. And they go, yep, you have appendicitis. After food passes through the duodenum, then it goes into the jejunum, which is almost half of your intestines. And this is where you have a lot of blood supply, so you can absorb the nutrients. And this is where most of the digestion and nutrient absorption takes place. After you leave the jejunum, you get to the ileum, and it has a lot of lymphoid nodules. So as this is passing through any bacteria that shouldn't be there, any uh, worms that you may have eaten in your food. I spent um, a tour of duty in Japan 
And I remember them eating raw fish, and I'm thinking, mm, no, I don't think so. And they go, well, if you freeze it, you kill 90% of the worms in the fish. And, of course, in my mind, I'm going, okay, 90 minus 100 is 10% of the worms are still alive and still in the fish. So I don't think I'm going to be eating that. But clearly, uh, it doesn't hurt you because a lot of people eat raw fish. So you have a lot of this malt, or you have this uh, immune system that will help you clean up the last little bit. Now, it's tricky. How do you know what's a good guy bacteria that you want to keep and a bad guy bacteria, one that you do not want in there? But somehow I know that these lymphoid nodules are able to differentiate between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, usually. Sometimes it doesn't work, and you end up with diarrhea. There is an artery running through the mesentery called the superior mesenteric artery, and it branches off and goes out to the jejunum and the ileum to provide the blood supply for most of the intestines. If you remember from the circulatory system, arteries take the stuff away from the heart and then it returns to the heart through the veins. So you have a superior mesenteric vein, but before it goes back to the heart, it goes into that hepatic portal system. So it branches off into little capillaries. So the liver has a chance to process all the nutrients that you, you digested in the small intestines. So even though the small intestines are many, many yards long, you want the food to go through slowly and you want to have as much surface area as you can. So the intestines are made with simple columnar epithelial cells, and you have goblet cells that secrete mucus to help keep this food moving along. You don't want it to dry out and stick in the intestines. You have circa, plica circularis, Plica circularis, which are circular folds, and these are going to increase the surface area of the intestines. Now remember, when you die, your intestines are longer because you lose your muscle tone. But while you're still alive, you're going to be folding up the intestines to slow the, the, the poop, the fecal mass down so that you have a chance to absorb all the good stuff that you, that you want. And then you have finger-like projections, which we call villi, and these also have on them microvilli. So you are getting more and more surface area. So you have more and more uh, places where you can absorb nutrients. So you got to slow the fecal mass down and absorb all the good stuff that you can. Otherwise, it's going to pass out in your feces and you don't get any nutritive value. Now, there was a fad for a while where people would take laxatives and the object was you could eat your food, but because you were taking laxatives, it, it uh, pulled fluid into the intestines, so much fluid that it just washed the food out before you had a chance to absorb it. So that And that was the goal of that. But that's not healthy. You need to be able to absorb nutrients. So it would be better if you ate smaller amounts uh, rather than eat large amounts and then take laxatives to get rid of it. Once upon a time, a long time ago, I was doing studies of toxic substances that could interfere with intestinal reabsorption. And uh, if you look for Karen W. Drake out on the internet, if you Google that, you can see some of the papers that we published uh, dealing with uh, diarrhea and toxins that affect the intestines. 
But one of the fun things that I got to do was play with the electron microscope, and you can actually see the microvilli. Now, this is upside down. So here's the lumen right here. So here would be your fecal mass moving along here. And these are projecting downward into the lumen. So those are the microvilli. And you can see how the, the nutrients are slowed down by these finger-like projections. Now, one of the things that the um, nutritionist should tell you is that you should eat fiber. You should eat things you cannot digest because as you're going through the intestines, these will act like a little broom and knock out trapped food. So it's always good to eat fiber. And people who have a low fiber diet are much more likely to get uh, colon cancer. So uh, eat, eat fiber, both soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. And here's a picture of the villi. This is a villus. Here's one. These are the finger-like projections. And these things that look like sesame seeds, those are goblet cells. They're full of mucus. So as the food comes along, it squeezes mucus out of these goblet cells. Now, somebody looked at them and said they look like goblets. I don't know. I don't see it. Here's a cross section through the ileum. So you can see those finger-like projections. You can see the lumen, the hole that the fecal mass is moving through. So it went from being a bolus to chyme because you mixed it with hydrochloric acid and then it becomes the what's eventually going to be the fecal mass or the poop. Here's an artist representation of those uh, villi that we saw. And here's one of the villas. So if you cut open and look inside, here you see the columnar epithelial cells right there. There's the goblet cells interspersed amongst them. And you're absorbing food. You're absorbing it. You're absorbing it. And inside, you have the blood vessels that are going to then take up the absorbed nutrients and carry it throughout the body. It's going to carry it to the heart and then throughout the body. But also in here, we have a modified lymphatic vessel. So most of the things that we talked about when we were talking about the lymphatic system is full of white blood cells, and its job is to pull the fluid that leaked out of the capillaries back into circulation. But as it's pulling it back into circulation, it checks what's in the plasma to see if there's any cancer cells, if there's any bacteria or viruses, and take care of it. But in the intestines, in the villi, it actually has a different function. And there, the function there is to absorb fat. So they actually get so full of fat, that they look like they're full of milk. And so they got the name lacteals. So lactate is to make milk, so lacteal. Now, if we could figure out a way to keep the lacteals from absorbing fats, without the fiasco that happened with the oline or the olestra, then we would not be absorbing too much fat and we could enjoy eating more fatty foods. So you get that lovely taste without getting the, the uh, weight gain because you've absorbed the fats into your body. I notice in this book that they talk about lymphatic nodules instead of payers patches, P-E-Y-E-R-S, payers patches. So for some reason, this book is taking away the names of people. Most of the things that you look at are named after the people who discovered them. 
but now they're just calling them lymphatic nodules and taking away the payer name. So there's the muscular layer of the intestines right there. And then there's the uh, villi, the little finger-like projections extending out in the lumen. And then back behind it, you have these immune cells, nodules, called payer's patches. In keeping with all the other things that are secreting into the digestive system, the intestines secrete one to two liters of intestinal juice every day. And this helps to extend or distend or expand your intestines. So it stretches your intestines because you're putting up to two liters of fluid in there. So you've got the food in there, and then you've got this extra fluid. And then don't forget, you had the, the bile, and you have the pancreatic juices. So you're getting quite a, a liquidy mess, but that's good because it pushes it up against the uh, villi and the microvilli so that you can absorb all the nutrients out. So we have two major kinds of motion occurring in the small intestines. One of them is they call it segmentation. And here's an artist's representation of what they think segmentation looks like. So you're pinching off and you're working on this section. You're pinching off and you're working on this section. So this is the segmentation portion. And this is while you're trying to absorb as much of the good stuff as you can. But then, once you've gotten most of the good stuff out, then you go and start peristalsis. And when you do peristalsis, you're going to start pushing it through and on out towards the rectum, which is kind of like a holding chamber. So it, you don't have to know how many times these things contract per minute, but... A lot of times when you go to the doctor, they'll use their stethoscope and they'll put it on your stomach, which you think is your stomach, but they're actually listening to hear the mobility, the sounds of the food moving through your intestines. They spend several slides talking about how you break down starches, how you break down glycogen, how you break down nucleic acids, and so on like that. And you're welcome to look through that. One thing I do want to point out is there are a lot of people who are unable to break down the sugar that's in milk. So the enzyme that you need is lactase, and the milk sugar is lactose, and you have to break it down into it's a disaccharide, it's two sugars stuck together. If you don't have this enzyme, you cannot break this down. And so it's going to stay in your intestines and it's going to hold water in your intestines. And if you hold too much water in your intestines, then you're gonna have diarrhea. You're also going to distend or stretch the colon. So you're gonna have the discomfort they call it bloating. And then you have bacteria in there who do like the lactose. And so they're going to start fermenting it. And anytime you ferment something, you're going to create a lot of gas. So people who are lactose intolerant, people who cannot break down lactose, are going to have diarrhea, vomiting, some of them actually end up having asthma attacks, uh, but usually it causes GI problems like gas and bloating. Now, this is a, a breakdown by the different cultures, but it also has to do with the age. So most children can digest milk fairly well. There are some that are lactose intolerant, and they have to have soybean milk, or now they have almond milk and other non-milk milks. And But as you get older, almost everyone becomes lactose intolerant. Now, whether it has something to do with age 
or if it has something to do with the fact that we take a lot of antibiotics over our lifetime. I don't know. But overall, about 15% of the whites in America have lactose intolerance. Almost 90% of the blacks do. About 70% of the people from the Mediterranean areas and almost every single Asian is lactose intolerant. So you'll not be seeing as many uh, pizzerias over in some of the Asian countries as you do in, say, America. Now, for those who are lactose intolerant, you can read the ingredients and see if there's milk, but you also need to look for whey. So when you're taking out the uh, solids from milk to make cottage cheese or regular cheese or butter. What's left behind is a, is a watery solution. And so you have to be careful because they need to get rid of whey and you can't just dump it into rivers and lakes. So they try to make, the, they sell it to people and they put it in bread. So if you look at bread, they've added whey to it. Uh, here in Kentucky, Apparently, you can give horses whey, and because it's so full of milk sugar, it's like giving them a, a stimulant, and so they run faster and better. And apparently, it's not illegal to give them whey to drink. So, where you know, there's certain drugs and things you can't give them to make them run better. I thought that was interesting since since we're in Kentucky. But there are a number of substances out there where the lactose is already broken down in the process of making it. For example, yogurt. Yogurt doesn't have lactose in it. So you can eat it with no problem. You won't get the gas, you won't get the bloating, but you will get the calcium that you need and the good nutrients that you need. A number of cheeses break down the lactose, not all of them, Two of them that come to mind that are broken down are um, cheddar cheese and Monterey Jack cheese. So if you're lactose intolerant or if you have trouble with diarrhea or gas, when you eat cheeses, start using cheddar cheese or Monterey Jack instead of mozzarella or the other cheeses. And instead of eating ice cream, eat frozen yogurt. Here's one of the little artist representations showing you that when you're eating fat, you have the lecithin and the bile acids that act on it and coat it and break it up into smaller bits. So this is called emulsification. And you have to do this with regular milk. So if you look at the, on the bottle of milk, it'll say grade A, pasteurized, homogenized vitamin D milk. So the pasteurized where you heat it in case there's any bacteria or something in it. Homogenized, you have to actually mix the milk up and break up the milk fat into tiny particles. Now, if you want to, you can mix it up and you can actually make the fat come to the top and skim it off and make butter up from it. So you have skimmed milk, which has had some of the fat removed from it. But uh, in the body, you use the lecithin and the bile acids to break up the fats into small enough droplets that you can absorb them into the villi and then on through the villi into the lacteals, which are the lymphatic vessels. I am going to spend a second talking about lipid digestion because it's really important in understanding how cells are made. So we showed the lecithin and the bile acid breaking up into little blobs, and then we talked about the different enzymes that are secreted by the pancreas. One of them is lipase, which is going to break down fats 
and you're going to have free fatty acids out there. You're going to have monoglycerides. You're going to have cholesterol, fat-soluble vitamins, and these are going to be carried along. And they call these little wads like this, they call them micelles. Micelles. Once you've transported these into the intestinal cells, the fat goes over to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And the smooth endoplasmic reticulum will take the fatty acids and it will take some of the sugars and it will reassemble them and make triglycerides. So a triglyceride is half of a sugar molecule with three free fatty acids attached. That's what the tri is. It's three fats on half of a sugar molecule. So sugar molecules have six carbons and you rip it in half and you have three carbons and that's how you make triglycerides. Everybody knows triglycerides are bad. You hear about it all the time. Oh my gosh, the person has high triglycerides. Well, again, you've got to have triglycerides because what you're going to do with the triglyceride is you're going to pull one of those fats off. You're going to add a phosphate group, and now you have phospholipids, and it's these phospholipids that make up every cell membrane in your body. So you've got to have triglycerides. You have to have them so you can make phospholipids and you can make your cell membranes. Otherwise, you can't repair if you lose a cell. You can't build a new cell. So again, it's how much triglyceride do you form and how quickly do you clear it from your bloodstream. So people who overeat are going to have high triglyceride levels. But after a few hours, after you've processed it, your triglyceride level should go back down to normal. So anytime they're looking at your triglycerides or they're looking at your cholesterol, you have to be fasting. Because otherwise, if you're eating, you're going to have high triglycerides. You will always have high triglycerides. Because that's what we're supposed to do. So after you've made your triglycerides, you've taken your fatty acids and your half of a sugar molecule, and you've made your phospholipids, and you've got your cholesterol going on, then what you're going to do is you're going to send it over to the Golgi apparatus. And if you remember, the Golgi apparatus pinches off at the end and so you have little bags full of fat and you send them by exocytosis out of the cell and it goes across and there's that lymph uh, capillary just sitting there and in go all of the little balls of fat until you fill them up and it looks like it's full of milk. So we call it a lacteal. So here's a summary of what we've been talking about throughout this uh, lecture. Your digestive tract, you get about uh, less than a liter of water through the foods that you eat. And you drink about one and a half liters of fluid. So drinking pop, drinking juice, water, you're going to get about this much. And if you remember all of those secretions, the saliva, the pancreatic juices, the bile, all of those uh, intestinal juices, you're going to have about almost seven liters. So you're going to have approximately eight liters total that's going to go into the small intestines. And you've got to reabsorb that back into the body. You don't want all of that to pass out with the fecal material. So you need to, to keep most of the fluid in your body so that you can keep making more gastrointestinal secretions. So you really only pass out about uh, a fifth of a liter, about 200 milliliters in your daily fecal output. 
that's assuming you don't have diarrhea or loose stools. So that's, that's the best that you can do. Now, if you don't listen to your body, when your body says it's time to poop, you're going to have a signal, and you'll actually feel the urge to push, and it's unmistakable. We do it every day, so you know what it feels like to, to need to poop. But unfortunately, in our day-to-day -day life, you're like, oh, I don't have time to go poop because I have to run for the bus, or I'm going to be late for work. So if I go in the bathroom and sit long enough to have a bowel movement, then I'm not going to be able to make it to the office on time. So there's all of these things going on where you can ignore the signal. And your body will wait 20 to 30 minutes and give you the signal again. Say, hey, remember you have a big fecal mass in your rectum and we need to get rid of it in your colon. So we need, we need you to go poop. And you're like, I, but I'm, I'm in class and I don't want to raise my hand and tell the teacher that I've got to go to the bathroom and poop. So you're going to say, well, I'm going to try and hold it till lunchtime, or I'm going to try to hold it till after school. And your body will send you the message maybe another time, and then after that it stops sending you the message. So, But unfortunately, as the fecal mass sits there, you're going to keep pulling water out of it, and you're going to keep pulling water out of it. So you're going to get a larger fecal mass, and it's going to be drier, and you're going to have more trouble passing it out. So a lot of people who have a hectic lifestyle and they don't make time to go to the bathroom end up constipated. So that word constipated is dried out poop. People who have constipation are more likely to have hemorrhoids, and they're more likely to have colon cancer. So it's just not a good idea. You need to make time in your life to get rid of fecal waste. So I want to spend a, a second or two talking with you about hemorrhoids because if you leave the fecal mass in there and you're trying to push it out, you can actually push the lining of the intestines out. So a hemorrhoid is actually an area where you have a buildup of, of blood and the tissue has been pulled loose. So an external hemorrhoid actually hangs out of your anus. And sometimes they're smelly. Sometimes they pop and bleed. And you can also have internal hemorrhoids. So you push the lining down, you push the lining down, you have a buildup of tissue, and you have the uh, blood vessels. So a lot of times people who are constipated, they're just used to, to bleeding when they poop. They're, they're just used to seeing their fecal material streaked with blood. If this is something that's going on in your body, you need to see a doctor. You should not be passing blood with your stool. So that's not a normal thing. And unfortunately, people who, who keep their um, anus irritated are likely to develop colon cancer. So this part of the rectum and, and the large intestines call your colon, and it's not uncommon for people to get colon cancer. And then uh, there are people who have a different sexual lifestyle, and we're seeing an upsurge on anal cancer. So if you're passing blood, you need to go to the doctor and have them look and see, is it just hemorrhoids, or is it colon cancer, or anal cancer? So one of the things I thought was really nice is a movie star named Farrah Fawcett came out of the closet, I guess you could say, and admitted that she was dying of anal cancer. So most people don't talk about it. They just say, well, so-and-so died of cancer, but they don't tell you what kind. But she wanted people to be aware uh, that this was uh, 
on the uptick. We're getting more and more cases of it. So don't ignore uh, blood in your stool. People who grow polyps in their intestines or in their colon are much more likely to develop colon cancer. So around the age of 40 to 50, depending on whether you have colon cancer running in your family, you should get a colonoscopy. And they, they put something that's a bit like a garden hose in through the anus and up into the rectum, and they look through the large intestine to see if you have any growths. And if you do, then they just go ahead and remove them. And they give you kind of a twilight sleep. So you're, you're under, so you, you're not on any discomfort whatsoever. Um, but you, so you don't feel them if they have to remove any polyps. And to see if you have colon cancer, one of the things that they do besides just the colonoscopy to go look and see if they see any cancer is they just take a little bit of your feces and they have a test they call the occult blood test. They look to see if there's any blood. So if you have a hemorrhoid that pops, you're gonna see what they call frank blood. You're gonna see red, bright red blood. So it's unmistakable. But if you have colon cancer, when it's in its early stages, you'll bleed a little bit into the intestines, but it'll mix in with the fecal mass, and you may not see it. So one of the things that they do is they take a stool sample. They just have you smear a little of your feces on a little uh, card, and then they have a test that they run to see if there's any blood mixed in with it. So anyway, I thought this was funny. Somebody gave me this picture. So the function of the large intestine is to receive about a half a liter of indigestible residue and pull the water out of it so you've only got like 150 milliliters left and then release that. So that's the role of the large intestines. So coming off of the small intestines, you have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon, and then you have the sigmoid colon. So sometimes instead of doing a complete colonoscopy where they run the tube all the way through and look all through this area they just do a sigmoidoscopy and they just go up into this region and look right here so here they tell you that hemorrhoids are permanently distended veins that protrude into the anal canal or bulge outside the anus now they used to tie off a hemorrhoid and so it would die, and, and it, would, it would just fall off. But nowadays, they use lasers and just zap them. Fat people are more likely to have hemorrhoids, and pregnant people are more likely to have hemorrhoids because you have all that pressure pushing down on your uh, large intestines, and it makes it harder to have a bowel movement. So if you want to impress your friends and your family, here are some fun facts that you can tell them. In your intestines, you have about 800 different species of bacteria. And most of these bacteria are in there helping us out. So they help digest some of the cellulose, not very much of it, but some of it, and some of the soluble um, fiber, some of the carbohydrates, which we can't digest, for example, lactose. And they help us synthesize the B vitamins and K vitamins. So they're actually helping us out. They're helping break down the food. But along the way, they're giving off gas. So where this gas builds up in your intestines, they call it flatus or flatus, and so you and I call it a fart. So you have this intestinal gas 
and it's going to come out. You have about half a liter of gas every day. So even people who are gorgeous and beautiful, they also have flatus or flatus, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, some of the gas is absorbed. Some of the air that you, when you're swallowing food, you're actually swallowing air along with the food that you're eating. So some of the uh, gas that you have down in your intestines is where you swallowed air. So, but you've got the bacteria making gas and you're swallowing air. And the, the bad smell that you're gonna smell is hydrogen sulfide, it's a sulfur. Uh, thing and of course you know that the um, methane is the natural gas so I'm surprised they don't tell you that right there uh, one of the fun things that people try to do is to see if they can catch a fart on fire and they do point out that some of the gas that you you make could explode if they're cauterizing you. So I told you that they can use lasers and they can burn away your hemorrhoids. So apparently if you're releasing gas while they're trying to burn away um, a hemorrhoid or fix something around the anal or rectal region that you, you may actually have an explosion So luckily, uh, the exploding hydrogen gas would be more of a pop uh, rather than actually blowing up your anus or blowing up the medical equipment. So you can try this experiment at home. Eat what I call an indicator food, for example, corn on the cob or corn niblets, and check your feces and see how long it takes for the corn to work its way from your mouth through your GI tract, through your small intestines, and out of your large intestines. So according to this slide, it takes anywhere from a day and a half to two days to go from eating something to turning it into feces. If you look at the feces, it's going to be about 75% water and 25% solids. And of the solids, about almost a third of it is bacteria. So this is one of the reasons why you do not want your well downstream from your outhouse. Because all those bacteria are going to get into the soil. And the, when it rains, it's going to wash into your well. And you're going to end up... Uh, with fecal contamination. Another reason you don't want to drink water from streams because animals go to the bathroom in the streams. So you're going to be getting fecal material and with your water. And another almost a third of, of the solids that come out as your feces is undigested fiber. 10 to 20 percent of your fecal mass is fat and then it's all covered with mucus to help it slide out. And then you have some random proteins and salts, and you have the cells that lie in the GI tract that will come out along with the feces. Babies and little kids usually aren't too busy to listen to their body when it tells them it's time to defecate. So usually with a baby or a little kid, right after they eat, they, they go to the bathroom, either in their diaper or they run to the bathroom and go to the bathroom that way. So, but again, as you get older, you get busy and you start ignoring those signals. In my day, we had a saying uh, about being uptight and so one of the things you cannot be is uptight because you can only poop or defecate if the external anal sphincter 
and the muscles are voluntarily relaxed. So if you can't sit down and relax enough to open up the sphincter, you're not going to be able to poop. And you can push. You can do the Valsalva where you push, you take your diaphragm and push down on the intestines to try and push it out. But you need to be able to relax. So some people actually have to take a newspaper in and read the newspaper so it distracts them and allows their body to relax, or they play little video games on their phone. Whatever it takes, you need to relax and allow time to be able to go to the bathroom. At the end of your chapter, they talk about the man with a hole in his stomach. So in 1822, there was a man in Canada who was shot, and it left a hole into his stomach that didn't heal. And so a physician paid him money to reach in the hole and take out stomach contents. So he did experiments on this guy and published a book about it. And because of being able to look in the hole and take samples out, uh, he laid the foundation for most of the information that we know now about the GI tract. So it's an interesting story. Before I sign off, I'm going to tell you something that you're probably going to think I'm making it up, but I'm really not. The, some people noticed that some people are skinny. They can eat anything they want, and they stay skinny. And you look at other people, and they really they overeat, but they don't overeat horribly. But they just cannot lose weight, and they just keep gaining weight. And so what they did is they looked at the, at the feces of the people who are skinny and the feces of the people who are fat, and they found different bacteria. So I mentioned earlier you have uh, about 800 different kind of bacteria. And so they did an experiment, and they took the feces from a person who's skinny and they killed off the bacteria that were in a fat person and they gave them a fecal transplant. So they, they took the bacteria that were inside of a skinny person and put them in a person who was fat and they started losing weight. So the bacteria definitely have some role in our digestive ability and uh, how well we can, can absorb foods. So, if you're fat, would you be willing to have a fecal transplant? <laughs>